Good evening and welcome to Newsnight. Headlines on Newsnight is brought to you by Eden Heights. Eden Heights, welcome home. Tonight, National Security dismisses allegations of torture leveled by editor of news portal ModernGhana.com following his 48-hour detention. Every question came with a slap, every slap. And then from there, they torture me. They use the, the, the electric shocker mm. to shock my body. And they even shock my ear to the shocker. After which, they put a handcuff on my hands and then they were giving me punches and all that. The flimsy allegations being... Meanwhile, editor Media Foundation for West Africa has described the development as an embarrassment to the country. Also tonight, President Akufado dismisses claims that new tertiary education bill, now ready for parliamentary consideration, the will take away academic freedoms. Allegations being perpetrated that the bill will underline, undermine academic freedom are deliberate mischief-making and disingenuous. Also in the National Science and Mass Quiz, Chemu Senior High School romps to quarterfinal stage of the competition despite late scare by St. Louis Senior High School. Multiply and simplify. X plus 2 multiplied by the expression X squared minus 2X plus 4. Desmond. The answer is X cubed plus 8. Yes. We have details here on Newsnight, also in business. And in business, we'll be hearing from the president of the Ghana Bank Association on what to expect in terms of full financial confidence being restored to the economy. Newsnight is brought to you by Puma Card from Puma Energy, cash free convenience. Do join us with your thoughts and comments via WhatsApp on 0244-340-437. I am MFA Apo. I'm here with Evans. Allegations of torture leveled by editor of the online news portal modernghana.com during his arrest and detention. Imano Ejafo Abugri and his colleague were picked up last Thursday by national security operatives. Now, they were accused of cyber fraud, a claim the media outfit denies vehemently. Imano Ejafo Abugri says he was subjected to all kinds of torture, including electric shock. We'll hear the national security's reaction shortly, but first, listen to him as he narrates his harrowing ordeal to join us. Every person came with a slap. Every slap. So when they ask a person before, we say, Jack, then they slap. I sometimes when I speak and they are not uh, too convinced uh, with my answer, they give me a slap. And then from there, they torture me. They use the, the, the electric shocker mm. to shock my body. And then... Even to the extent they even shocked my ear to the shocker. After which they put a handcuff on my hands behind, and then they were giving me punches and all that. And from there they made me they made me go to the military style where I have to lean against a wall with my legs up, with my hands down as if I'm doing a pepper. Mm. Then they gave me a huge slap on my back. Then I fell. Then um, one guy used his elbow and then straight on my backbone. He hit it and I fell down. Uh, I lost breath for a while, so I had to open my mouth and gush in air mm -hmm. so I could survive. And I cried like a newborn baby, telling that I am innocent. I don't know the Kwab, the, the constant Kwaben guy. And then the second story uh, was actually a press release, which we published. Mm. So after all this torturing, when finally were you released and, and how did that happen? So so actually, actually, they took me on Thursday and they released me on Saturday morning. And so on Saturday morning, I was there. And then um, um, I was there, and then they came and called me that, look, uh, they have to release me to go. They have to bail me to go. So they gave me my shoe, my belt, my, you know, they took my phones, they took my two phones, my tablet, and my laptop. So they, so when we got there, they took, I, they collected the password. So I gave my phones to them and all that. So after going through, they didn't see anything. Then when they were releasing me, they gave me the phones and my tablet. But my laptop is still with them as we speak now. But you are accused of hacking into systems of corporate bodies and your when, competitors. When is they that were the questioning case? Me, mm -hmm. When they were interrogating me, those issues of hacking never pop up. Okay. Now, 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 if they, if they, if, now, if they are saying that I hack into their system, when they came to my office and read it, what communication gadget did they pick? And when they went through my, my laptop and my phones, which, what, which uh, hacking software did they see? 
And which corporate email or corporate organization did we hack? Okay. Are, we, do, are, are they not supposed to be told those organizations? Are, are they not entitled to know? So mm. that they can also do checks from their side to find out that indeed somebody tried tempering with their system and then they can also come up with their of the, of findings and also uh, do proceed further? Okay. No, I don't have an IT background. So as it stands now, are you supposed to report back uh, to the National Security or I'm the BNI? I'm on my way. I'm on my way. I'm supposed to report in the morning, but I wasn't feeling well. I had to take my medicine. And as it stands now, are you getting any medical attention? Have you reported yes, to the... Yes, I immediately, when they released me, immediately I had to go to a hospital. Yes, because I was suffering. Um, we're now hearing from National Security uh, as far as what their own account is. Uh, my, my colleague and head of the security desk, Gifty, Andrea Pia, is here with the details of that. Gifty, let's address the allegations as we just heard one after the other. Let's yeah. start with the claim that he was electrocuted. What are your sources at the National Security saying about that? So, Evans, our sources are saying that, first of all, they don't have electrocution equipment there at the premises of the National Security. And I personally cannot say that I've been there to see whether or not that equipment exists. But what we have have gathered so far from our sources is that they don't have an equipment to do this. He says he was also beating, punched at some point. Mm. So there's a denial of that as well. But what we also gather is that a report has been made to the effect that they were beaten up. They've been issued at the Legon police station and they've been issued a police uh, um, report, a medical report, a medical form uh, that they are subsequently uh, expected to have uh, these confirmed by a, a, a medical officer. And so we'll have to um, get back to the editor whom we spoke to to confirm uh, what the medical report from the police say. Another very interesting revelation he also put put out was that when he was first arrested, he was blindfolded. There was a, a plastic, a black polythene bag that was used to cover mm. his head. Um, is the national security aware of this and what is your reaction to that? So our sources there again say there were no polythene bags at the time that they were handed over after the arrest was made. But again, Evans, there is a need to indicate that this may have happened at the time that they were arrested based on the report of those who were arrested um, have given us, even though our sources within say there were no polythene bags upon arrival of these people at the national security premises. And the interrogation. Um, he says that he was, he was interrogated and asked questions about a publication that he had done, two of them, to be very precise. What 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 what, what exactly happened with those mm. questions? So uh, the the allegations that allegation that he makes on this uh, part is that on this point is that they were interrogated mainly on the publication. Um, even though the allegations of cyber crimes, uh, you know, had been already reported, but they're saying that uh, my resp- my uh, uh, sources are saying that. Uh, uh, the interrogation was just about their ability and how they were able to enter the systems of the media houses. And we're told that there is a big, I can't speak in media organizations uh, uh, we're looking at here. We gather that some confessions have been made to the effect that uh, they had credentials that gave them access to this media houses systems from where they took stories and published as their own, uh, as well as access other sensitive information such as financial transactions. Uh, We also know that, we also been told that one of them said the credentials were given to him by an individual who used to work with this organization. So investigations are ongoing and requests have been made to bring in this person who supposedly gave the credentials to. Was he reporter. arrested with a warrant? So he, they were not arrested with a warrant. So I've been trying to get our sources to uh, speak to that, that you cannot, we know that you can't, you cannot just arrest someone without a warrant. But the responses we're getting, and we've had some education from Article 14 of the Constitution as well, to the effect that there are circumstances under which you can make an arrest without a warrant. And two, uh, two key parts of that circumstance, of those circumstances is that one, when there is um, threat of evidence tampering, so... In cases like these, uh, if there is cyber crime, for example, if you don't go in and quickly take the gadgets which they are led to be doing this uh, practice with, then they may tamper with it and you may not get the evidence. So in cases like this, you can. And in cases where there is threats that the suspects may escape, you can also arrest without a, a warrant. Okay. Uh, Gifty, thank you very much. Let's uh, bring in uh, Executive Director of the Media Foundation for West Africa. Obviously, following this, they, they catalog these cases. Uh, Suleiman Abrama is on the line with us. Mr. Brahma, thank you for your time here on Newsnight. What's your reaction to this particular story and how it's unfolded over the last uh, few days? Well, um, I remain quite shocked um, that this is a development in Ghana 
Um, we used to um, file reports such as this um, in the days of Yahya Jame in the Gambia. We do read reports such as, as this from our partners in Somalia and Eritrea um, and other international partners based in places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. So um, sometimes I, I ask myself, is it, I mean, is it true that these things are happening in Ghana, that we are at a point where national security would read a media organization on the basis of whatever allegations there are, um, take them to, you know, national security officers. And as we are hearing now, um, the journalist saying um, he was tortured. I, I would wonder why um, the journalist would just come out and make up a story, knowing very well, for example, that perhaps the matter is still under investigation. If he was not tortured, I'm wondering why um, he would make, make such a claim. So I think it's a very, very disturbing development. And it really um, has a, a significant collateral damage on our international human rights reputation and our press freedom credentials as a country. And um, if, if this is added to a series of developments that have happened over the last um, six or seven months, I think that as a country, we should all be worried and the authorities must begin um, to implement steps to ensure that our reputation is redeemed um, rather than continuously going down the line. National security is tonight denying the claims that they tortured him, that he electrocuted him, that he was beating. Yes, of course, we know he's been arrested and kept for 48 hours. They claim under justifiable suspicion. Um, this, as you pointed out, it's not the first time, you know, allegations such as this have, has, has been made in the last few months. Uh, this, you, you think this will go some way to further, uh, you know, hit our reputation as far as press freedom is concerned? Already we've dropped uh, from our first ranking on the continent. No, I, I think that there have been um, other developments that already, um, certainly if um, press freedom ratings were done today, Ghana would not even be in a number four that it dropped to um, this year. And um, tomorrow we, we would put out a statement in which we will catalog a number of uh, these developments that should give all of us cause for worry. Uh, and increasingly it appears to me that there is some growing culture of intolerance in, in, in the country. Uh, dissenting views, people cannot tolerate dissenting views. And where um, people feel, well, they can apply um, power or force, uh, immediately those things are exerted. I think we need to always remind ourselves that we are a country governed by law and not by power or force. And the media have certain fundamental rights. We have our democracy thanks to partly the great role that the media have played. We know that governments around the world are struggling to deal with um, the excesses you know, as a result of digital media, social media, and so on and so forth. But certainly those ways of I mean, dealing with these excesses cannot include national security, raiding media offices, picking up people, detaining them, and as we are hearing, torturing them. I'm grateful Suleiman Abrama. He's executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa. So listening to News Night here on Joy 99.7 FM. And we understand um, the, the two journalists who were picked up from Morning Ghana will be sent to court arraigned uh, tomorrow. And we'll keep an eye on that and bring you the latest as and when we get it. Let's go to Jubilee House right now because the president has been making pronouncements when he attended the, uh, a ceremony at the University of Professional Studies and says that uh, has described as flimsy and deliberate mischief making claims that the new tertiary education bill will take away academic freedoms. Now, the bill is set to be put before Parliament following completion of broad stakeholder consultation. It will, among others, bring all public universities under one legislation and streamline university administration. And like you said, the president was addressing the 11th congregation of the University of Professional Studies, and he indicated that his government fully supports academic freedoms and will work under the bill uh, to promote it. Consultations on the public universities bill have been completed and will be laid before Parliament this year. Amongst others, this will bring all the public universities under a common law and thereby make the administration of the public universities less cumbersome and more efficient. The flimsy allegations being perpetrated that the bill will underline, undermine academic freedom 
are deliberate mischief-making and disingenuous. My government and I are firm subscribers, as the bill amply demonstrates, to the cardinal importance of the principle of academic freedom in the development of all institutions of learning worth their salt. I commend the Council and management of the University of Professional Studies for placing emphasis on courses relevant to the needs of the Ghanaian economy, particularly management sciences, accountancy, marketing, banking and finance, now, a man at the seat of government is Elton Brobe. He was with the president today at the UPSC. And amongst others, the president has been talking tough right. uh, today when it comes to lawyers who support what he describes as negative practices. What exactly are his concerns? Well, for, he, he mentioned, for example, lawyers who supervise the payment of some dubious judgment debt. And for him, such practices tend to give the profession a bad image. And mm -hmm. he wants those who are entering the, the profession to be guided by the actors of the work and the work according to their own conscience. Yeah, and then, but, 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 but we can deal with the matters that, that came up as far as the public university bill is concerned. Now, for them, uh, and w w what we've picked so far is mm -hmm. that it will provide for the procedure for the establishment of public universities, principles of management of public universities, the legal studies of public universities, the procedure for financing public universities and administration, as well as supervision of the activities of public universities and related matters. Now, what they are seeking to cure, for, for, for example, they have the view that some public universities, as, as far as the, 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 the council membership is concerned and the, and, and, the, and the term of office, some range between two to three to four years. They want to unify it, harmonize it, uh, make it such that all public universities will have a time frame within which they can operate. Now, Evans, the interesting thing about this whole thing is that usually when a bill uh, is generated by government, it is put before parliament, the speaker refers it to the appropriate committee, and then they will start a consultation process where people can now bring in their inputs. Now, what we've been told is that when this particular draft was developed and it was given to the vice chancellor to study, it got leaked. And people started talking about it. That's how come the consultation is starting even before the bill will be put before Parliament. What government says it will do is that they have listened to the concerns of some of the lecturers. It will find expression in the bill that will be put before Parliament, hopefully this week. They hope that by the, by, by, by the time Parliament goes on a recess, we will have a bill that will regulate all public universities to conform them to a single law uh, as far as their administration is concerned. Uh, Elton, thank you very much. So, on news night on Joy 99.7 FM, now uh, to Parliament now, where Majority Leader Oseche Mensabonsu has justified the need for a new parliamentary chamber, despite criticism the proposed edifice is a misplaced priority. Now, listen to Kumbungu MP Rasmo Borag, who wants Parliament to reconsider the decision to build a new 450 seater chamber. What is wrong with the uh, current chamber? If it's not working, why must we attempt to, to fix it? And to think that we are even contemplating on building a chamber to take up 450 members of parliament for the future for me is an outrage. You know, um, we're a very small country, and even if the population of Ghana in the future reaches 50 million, this country does not need 450 members of parliament. You know, and I think as a country, we seriously need to get uh, priorities right. We don't need it, you know. And what would be our explanations to uh, to our constituents who need amenities, who need roads, who need you know water, who need school? This is not something that we ought to be entertaining. And my position is that it's, uh, it's, it's an outrage. You know, uh, already there's a collapse of trust in, in politicians, you know, by the public. And uh, people are wondering whether we are getting our priorities right. And look at West, the architecture at Westminster. I mean, they don't have seats for enough members of parliament. I well, Majority Leader Sir Chairman Sabon, who is also Minister for Parliamentary Affairs, says the current facility is unable to accommodate all members of parliament and ministers of state during functions. He's been justifying the need for the new facility. Even uh, we have more than, uh, more than 60 non-MP ministers and deputy ministers. On occasions, they are required to be in the chamber. Even sometimes DCEs on the occasions may be required to be in the chamber to be witnesses of one thing or the other. So we provide adequate space. But now, when all members of parliament are and ministers appear, many of them do not have any, any place to sit. Some have necessary to stand. 
which is not the best. So it's the reason why we, we, we it doesn't mean that um, uh, it is anticipated to raise the number to 450. That's not the, that's not the intent. We started well, the speaker, Professor Michael Quay, unveiled the design for the new edifice during a ketsi call on him by the architect David Ajayi on Friday. He's been speaking to joinees about the proposed new Parliament House building. We are hoping that the project will uh, sometime this year start on site. As the speaker said, the government has committed to it in the budgets, and if we are able to start this year, it can be completed within the next three years. At the moment, the way the master plan works is that you have the sort of buildings of the Third Republic, the two pavilions, one is the Parliament, one is the Banqueting Hall. And um, what we're now doing is removing the parliamentary chamber to this new chamber and refurbishing the old Parliament to be another conference facility for Parliament. With that, we're also putting all the car parks that you see that are on surface parking under the Parliament for security. So parliamentarians can drive into a secure zone and rise up directly into the chamber, but also to allow diplomatic uh, uh, sort of uh, visits that are coming to also be able to have their own secure port come in, the president to also be able to come in, and for all the support facilities, press galleries, libraries, museum to talk about the history of our parliament, our unique democracy, as well as support facilities are all going to be housed in this main block. Uh, MFO, there's a fundamental question mm -hmm. about how much this, this will cost. cost. The Speaker of Parliament has been addressing that. We had a uh, a tender process by which we had three architectural firms competing for this job, two from Ghana, two, one from abroad, and um, overwhelmingly, not only us, the Institute of Engineers were asked to make uh, an analysis and bring a report which was one-sided overwhelmingly in favor of those that have now been chosen. So we are making progress. And has committed itself to some funding, it reflected in the budget. And we are also looking for external sources to complement that project. Within the parameters of parliament, there will be a canteen, there will be every possible thing you can imagine, from um, a hotel to um, eating places. In fact, nobody needs to leave the parameters of this building in order to say, I mean, I'm going to eat and come. If it's one hour break within the parameters, you should be able to eat and report to work. And all these are going to go back to the changes we are making, including our clocking in and so on and so forth. So that's a, uh, that's a Speaker of Parliament. What do, you, what do you think of this, though? I mean, some estimates that came out first said uh, pulled the figure at $200 million. Uh, and many who have used the Job 600 building that was recently commissioned for them a few years back know that that building has a gym already, has a canteen, mm -hmm. has a library, has all the facilities, has a mosque, etc., already in it. Uh, for the MPs already. Um, let's bring in the uh, some somebody who really deals with Parliament, uh, Parliamentary uh, African Centre for Parliamentary Affairs uh, head, uh, Dr. Dramani, is on the line with us. Dr. Draman, thank you for time here on Newsnight. I, is this really a priority for Parliament now? Um, I think maybe beyond just a priority for Parliament, I think we should ask whether it's actually a priority for our nation. I think that's uh, perhaps maybe the way I want to put the question. Um, and if you ask me that, I would say no, because I think uh, we have a number of burning priorities as a nation, um, especially also given that this is coming on the back, uh, Evans, you were, you were, I think you covered the the um, refurbishment and the renovation that took place in the current chamber when Right on Abu Doha Jaho was head of the sixth parliament. I think there was a lot of uh, a lot of I mean hue and cry in terms of the cost to the nation. Yeah, well, when we imported almost every single mm -hmm. item, including yeah. the chairs, and I remember there was exactly. a big issue with it. That's exactly. very recently. Exactly, and so the question is, uh, have we had value enough? For the investment that has been made in this current chamber and and as i was telling your colleague earlier i mean i have been to all the parliaments that 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 exist on this uh, on our continent and i think we have one of the one of the 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 the, the most beautiful i mean parliaments if if you ask me in terms of uh, 
the design of the chamber, in terms of the look. I have brought in delegations from different countries, uh, different African countries, to our parliament. I mean, most recently I was there with a delegation from Burkina Faso. I mean, there was a lot of admiration for, for what we have. And this is after the millions of euros that, that were sunk that were sunk into, into bringing the current chamber to where it is. Look, we, brought, we borrow our tradition from, from, from the British. I mean, you go to England today, I mean, sometimes MPs even have to stand to, to carry out parliamentary business because they want to preserve tradition. They want to say this was a chamber that was used by people like Winston Churchill and so on and so forth. But in our country, I think we have a penchant for, you know, I don't know, procurement, uh, pulling structures down, and spending money that we don't have. I think that for me, that's, that's, the, that's the most... And then spending money that we don't even know how much it's going to cost us. I mean, that's, for me, that's the most disturbing part. Dr. Derman, I'm, I'm grateful that, that you join us with your thoughts on this. What do you make of this? Send us a WhatsApp, 0244340437. George Affair is here to talk money, actually. Hello, George. Hi, Evanson. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, interesting commentary there and looking forward to the other game as well. Well, coming up in business, we'll hear from ECOWAS on the possible threat of uh, issuing the single currency, the ECO, that is uh, from next year. And also be hearing from uh, when will we witness actually the full financial confidence in terms of after cleaning up the whole financial sector. We'll hear from the president of the Bankers Association, that is Al Hassan and Dani. Let's now settle for the details. Now, from next year, the match talked about the single uh, currency, that is the ECO, should be in circulation. But the concern here is that what are the threats to this currency and whether the whole region, that is the West African monetary zone, is ready for this. Let's hear from ECOWAS in terms of its own perspective on what are the threats. Kofi Kunedo Apreku is the ECOWAS Commissioner for Macroeconomic Policy and Research. The challenges, uh, as I indicated, is the convergence criteria. How the countries prepare themselves and how they are able to meet the convergence criteria. For example, some of the countries, without mentioning names, that are meeting the, the convergence criteria now are probably not the strongest economies. And therefore, probably, just speculating, that will be difficult to just start with them alone. We need some of the bigger economies, and the three largest economies are Nigeria, Ghana second, Cote d'Ivoire third, and fourth, Senegal. So if these countries are there, then it makes it even better. So the smaller countries can join. But we have not made any distinction. We have said that countries that meet the convergence criteria will start. As others meet the convergence criteria, they will join. And I can't predict which countries will be able to meet. We'll hope for the Ghana we are, will be there. Of course, I have to. I have to foot, hope that my own country will be there. Kofi Kunedo Apreku is ECOWAS Commissioner for Macroeconomic Policy and Economic Research. Now, full financial sector confidence will be realized by the end of this year. Now, that's the projection coming from the president of the Ghana Association of Bankers, Al Hassan and Dani. Confidence in the banking sector is said to have been realized after the Bank of Ghana completed the cleanup in that area. However, there are fears that gains made so far could be eroded as a result of the planned reforms in the macro uh, finance and savings and loan sectors. But Mr. Andani disagrees. So patronize the right product so that you know we don't get back to the, the situation where we got it. So we need that confidence from the micro savers to, to come up so that we can talk about total uh, confidence in the financial services sector. And any projections on when that will be realized? I believe that if the measures taken by the Bank of Ghana in trying to you know to look at the uh, troubled microfinance company, if they can conclude it by the end of the year, by 2020, uh, things should begin to settle across the broad spectrum of the financial services industry. Look, the banks are doing well the banks will be the bigger locomotive mm -hmm. dragging everybody along mm -hmm. yeah have we learned our lessons that even though we would have few challenges we won't get to the state again nothing we have learned our lessons 
Alassane Andani is president of the Ghana Association of uh, Bankers and the commodity trading firm Isoko is forecasting uh, some marginal increase in the prices of foodstuffs for this month. Now, this was contained in its monthly uh, review of prices of foodstuffs across the general uh, markets in the country. So, make, make some adjustment in your budget for foodstuff because they are forecasting that we will witness some marginal increase in the foodstuffs that are sold on the market across the major markets that they sampled in the country and that's all for business on Newsnight. Uh, John, thank you very much. And uh, when is your school in next in the? I think it will be year? that's precise. I don't know the actual date that they are coming, but uh, we're just praying that they You're sail through. Not following your school. <laughs> Uh, what what how do, how is Chemu performing MFA? Um, Chemu just uh, made it to the quarterfinals. Um, they beat they had to beat um, the likes of Saint Louis Senior High School and uh, they got an earlier scare uh, by that school. But they've just uh, gone through and it's in this competition they've joined the other schools in the one eight stage. And I'm told that Presec is doing that on Thursday. Ah, we'll uh, see. We're expecting them to. We'll see. Uh, to, and and when is Olaf coming back? Oh, we'll, we are still in the competition. <laughs> don't worry. But what happened to Akwena? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, we we were tired of winning, so we just decided to let the other people you know, God try still their an old Tom? God has always been an old Tom. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for Newsnight tonight. My name is Evans Mentor. I am Emma Fapo. We have commentary coming up. Please do stay.